Good evening, everyone. Well, first of all, thank you to SEMT for inviting me here this evening. It certainly is an honour. Uh, I'm not sure I justify it, but let's see. As Andy said, he insisted that I take you back through a career. Um, I'm not sure you want to hear all the details of my career, so I hope I've done a, a bit more than just talking about my career. Um, and again, let me reiterate my thanks to Dolby as well. So, first step, this doesn't work. There we go. I couldn't start this presentation without uh, giving reference to Bill Lovell. Sadly, I didn't know him. I'm sure I've met him, but I didn't know him that well. Uh, so, hence the need to do a little bit of research. Uh, there is a strand here with people having spent some time at the BBC, so there is a link between all of us in that respect. But I, I rather like this quote, saying that Bill was a true gentleman, someone you could trust and rely on, made an impression on so many people, and was always so um, extremely generous with his knowledge. Something to aspire to, I think, and um, to live up to uh, for all of us. So... As I say, it's sad that I didn't know him better, but I, I, I respect him from the, the very good words that well, everyone can see throughout uh, the internet. And some of you in this room, I'm sure, did indeed know Bill Lovell very well. As Andy mentioned, Roderick uh, gave the presentation last year, and just keeping on that theme of um, strands that sort of run through all of us, another person who started their career at the BBC um, but there are some other links. Um, Roderick's has a fascination with audio. I remember him um, uh, giving a lecture in London whereby um, he, was going to, he was trying to tell us all that you didn't need all these speakers around the room in the ceiling. Um, I don't know how many there are, but the, if you just look around, they're everywhere. And they are indeed in the ceiling for Atmos. Um, Roderick was looking into a phased array that uh, would enable you to have one speaker in the front and still have immersive audience, uh, audio out in the, the audience. So a fascination with audio is something that I definitely share with uh, Roderick and we've both worked on some very similar technologies. Standards converters um, absolutely was an area that I worked on. And um, having said all of that though, uh, as I'm sure you'll agree, Roderick is a, a major industry figure and all of these people make tonight a very, very tough act to follow. So what is tonight? Um, well, I did discuss with Andy as to whether or not it was a good idea to do this on a Friday evening, uh, just before the weekend. And Andy said, no, it, it will work. People will come. Uh, and you have. Thank you very much for that. Uh, but having said that, I definitely didn't want to make tonight uh, too heavy, too techy. Not least of all, because I'm delighted to say I have some of my friends and some of my family in the audience, so I need to put in something for everybody. I hope there is indeed that. So what I'm going to do is give you a portfolio of random thoughts, um, thoughts about the industry, career. Um, I'll loosely hold it together with uh, a bit of a career timeline. And hopefully I can impart upon you some of the excitement that I've experienced um, throughout uh, my ongoing career and share some of those experiences with you. Um, the health warning is that um, we are all different. What uh, gets us excited is all different. What we like to do in our careers is all different. So my conclusions and my assertions um, your, may be different. Your mileage may be different to mine. So treat what I say with caution. So, um, a few more thanks. My parents there. I guess none of this would have been possible without them. So, uh, thanks to my parents for making it all possible. Always have to start at the beginning, don't you? <laughs> and you see I'm looking up to the sky there and I, I put words into my mouth. I was sure I was saying, one day I think I'll be a broadcaster, media technologist and executive. Well, actually, I think probably I wasn't at that stage, but very soon after, I was. Um, early beginnings. Uh, I don't know, you, most of you in this audience are engineers, so I'd be interested to know if you've sort of shared similar traits. But uh, at school, going on, uh, yeah, definitely at school, I was absolutely a person who was 
making things and trying to find out how things work, fascinated by electronics. And my era, few of in the audience, maybe two, was the Beatles. That was the, the heyday of the Beatles up there. Um, so I took things apart, such as that. That's not the actual record player, but it was very similar. I took that apart. Uh, to find out how it worked um, and frequently as it says there when I put them back together again they didn't work um, but what I did do uh, I modified it because as a school student I didn't have any money to buy amplifiers and things so I ended up um, modifying the record player so I could plug a guitar into it and I ended up actually even making my own guitar which surprisingly did last for several years. Beatles were very prevalent and one of my first recorders was um, actually it wasn't the first I had a stereo recorder but this was multi-track this was a four channel TIAC A3440 isn't it weird how you can arrange remember um, strange things like that why should I remember that well, apart from the fact it's printed there of course but why should I remember it was A3440 that's a totally useless piece of information but I do um, and that was my first recorder when I was getting into sound recording um, I didn't do that well at school. Uh, I did okay, just about enough to, to get into university, but I didn't do that well and I wasn't happy at school. And, um, and suddenly things changed when I went to university. And again, I don't know if any of you have experienced this. And I, I was thinking about why was that? And I realized it was the first time I'd actually made uh, my own decision about my, my own future, which university to go to. Uh, what I wanted to do at university, what subjects I wanted to study. So it was the first time I was given the opportunity to determine my, f uh, at least uh, attempt to determine my future. And so I think what I put that down to is the fact that my motivation increased dramatically uh, and, um, and left behind that rather mediocre uh, school record. And the other thing I think was important about university it was a period of reflection between school and going to work. I think uh, it certainly served me well to just sort of get out of the home, find out what's going out in the wide world before I started committing myself to a job and a career. Um, I went to Essex University. Some of you may or may not recognize the, the buildings there. Uh, really enjoyed it. And, uh, and in fact, it was at that time the only university that promised not to uh, teach anything about vowels, which was particularly attractive. <laughs> Um, anyway, many of my colleagues, when they, when they left, um, went on into the defence sector. And that was a soft touch in those days because there was lots of money in the defence sector and, um, and the money was, was good. And it, at the time it seemed like a secure job. With hindsight, perhaps not quite as secure as you might imagine. Um, so I, I wasn't so keen on that. Um, uh, although uh, I, the money was good. So I decided that the, the BBC might be fun and inevitably aligned with my earlier interests. I have to say actually, and I'm sure it's different now Andy, but when I joined the BBC I was somewhat disillusioned because as I went round the studios, I was working on the studio gear, some of those recorders, some of those record decks they were so badly aligned that the performance out of them was in some cases sub-consumer. So uh, I was a bit disillusioned when I joined the BBC. Oh, quite a few of you from the BBC, that's uh, blotted by cough people. I'm sure it's different now. Um, but anyway, my, one of the conclusions was I assumed that the BBC was more socially responsible than the defence industry, having not intentionally killed anybody, perhaps uh, through boredom but not uh, through any uh, missiles. Um, but thinking about careers, uh, clearly education is important, gives us options and opportunities, how to direct our lives. Um, and hopefully, um, for most of us, it gives us a chance to match our passion and our interests and the responsibility, because inevitably we do all influence others. And as I said, the university was important. It gave me time to think about what I wanted to do. Um, and I think that is important um, to be able to think about what for you personally are your priorities. On leaving university and meeting some very clever people, later at the IBA, which I'll come to, this conversation started, 
there are a lot of very clever people at the IBA, and, and I realised that um, some of those people had not had anything like the kind of educational background that I'd had. I'd gone in, I studied electronics at university, audio, video, very focused and narrow sort of approach to my education, but some of the very clever people I were, was working with had taken degrees which were incredibly broad, vaguely technical, but not applied science in any sense. And so it led to some quite interesting discussions, ones without a conclusion because it's, uh, it's, uh, everyone is different, but uh, there's a lot to be said for generalist education and being able then to come into a career and call upon a much wider experience. Uh, many people will say you can always learn on the job, as it were, if you've got the right kind of background and the right kind of generalist career. I didn't go that way, but I had a huge respect for some of the people that I worked with who'd perhaps not done an electronics degree, something much broader, and had joined the industry. So there's something to think about there um, in terms of careers and education. Uh, the other kind of decision that I think has to be made is to decide whether you're a small or a large company person. If you get that wrong, I suspect um, it can cause you a degree of misery. Um, and I clearly in the early days decided that I was looking for a large organisation, uh, enjoyed in many ways the infrastructure support that goes around it. Clearly in a big organisation there are social aspects, people you meet and you work with. Uh, and also large organisations are perhaps seen rightly or wrongly as making the, the big changes in industry and therefore you are part of something big that is happening and, and that kind of appealed to me. The alternative is to join a small com smaller company. Um, there, the big thing there is that you're not compartmentalised quite so much and you perhaps have a chance to enjoy a wider range uh, on experience, a wider range of skills and experience. But then I'm generalising a lot, but then you're tending to specialise in a smaller part of the total industry. So I think as you sort of develop and you choose your careers. Um, I was actually pleased that I perhaps given that a little bit of thought when sort of selecting because I did have offers from smaller companies uh, in addition to the BBC and I decided that the at least at that time larger companies were for me. Okay so this is where it gets serious. Um, I obviously made the right decision in going into broadcast because um, this is part of my career. Um, it's, I think they loosely call it research. <laughs> um, but uh, the careers advisor, as it said, they didn't tell me research involves snakes. Um, the reason I show this photograph is to be a little bit flippant, but there is a very serious side. My, my life could have taken a very different turn if things had gone wrong. This photo was taken in China. I had a chance to visit China quite a few times, which I very much enjoyed, as you can see there. Um, but it was very interesting going to China. But in this case, one of my colleagues took the photograph. Um, back at, uh, yeah, he is still a colleague, actually. <laughs> um, back at um, IBC, uh, that same colleague, Bill Hayes, some of you know, perhaps, IEEE, he took that photograph. Bill Hayes showed the photograph to Jane, who is here in the audience. Um, ho I was hoping she would be my future wife at that time. And um, he showed her just minutes before, he didn't know, but I was planning to propose to her. Yeah. He showed her that. What <laughs> chance did I have? Um, but, <laughs> but anyway, it was at IBC and um, I was actually attending an IBC council dinner. Uh, where Bill Hayes and 30 other or so colleagues were there. And so I did propose to Jane um, in front of those, thinking it's going to be a little bit harder for her to refuse and say no in front of that audience. And uh, thank God, phew, the wedding did go ahead, folks, and uh, absolutely very pleased that it did. So um, Bill did his best to ruin it. He didn't know what he was doing at the time, but it didn't happen. So I nearly missed out on my best decision. It's not just about career decisions. Okay, uh, now 
I want to make it clear, I was not around in the time of Baird. <laughs> Just in case um, you, you get that misunderstanding, but a very kind uh, relative who knew I was in the industry gave me, in fact, this televisor and some of those very early recorded discs, which I still have. And the picture there is a picture of um, one of Baird's recording. It's actually the recording from that disc. 30 lines. Today it can be faithfully reproduced in a, a GIF um, in terms of uh, that's how I'm displaying it there just as a GIF but that's as, as good as it gets. In fact it's been processed to try and improve it a bit. And there is a point that I want to make here um, because Baird is credited with inventing TV but uh, a lot of people feel that he, he got it horribly wrong. And he had a, he had a blind spot allegedly right up to 1931 which I suspect was when there was the shootout between Baird and EMI. Baird believed that low definition television, 30 lines, would be the perfect match for the narrow bandwidth of the medium wave and being mechanical scanning would be inexpensive to produce and therefore uh, a good way to build equipment for the masses kind of arguments you can't fault in their isolated sense but they were wrong um, he was given advice to say no that that's not the way to go but he convinced himself on on these arguments and as we all know he lost out to the EMI uh, solution interestingly enough it is just the sideline but when uh, TV was inaugurated which I assume was 240 lines um, this plaque was uh, subsequently created that called it high definition which is quite interesting in that respect I'm sure many of you have seen that before but anyway the, the point about this and, and I'll come back to it is that um, you can it depends what criteria you set for the rightness of your decision and based upon the criteria that Baird set he was right but from a big picture point of view he was wrong and I've seen that so many times throughout my career. The other thing is which I find rather fun is the I put the word metadata underneath the label there uh, as all of you in this well most of you in this room know metadata is data about um, data and the data is the picture and in this case the metadata is essential saying shows lady moving head and smoking cigarette because actually without that you may not know whether it was a woman or a man and definitely you still can't see whether she's smoking a cigarette there so first example of metadata being absolutely essential BBC then those early days another lesson to be learnt apart from the fact that the quality of some of these machines was not what I'd expected from a professional organization. My first job was modifying um, BTR2 tape decks from valve to transistor. The valve box on the left, transistor box top right. And um, this is again an example of um, over the years I've seen very often it's not worth trying to keep an old technology going. There's a point at which you say let it go and let's start with something new. The logic was we've got these machines, we can upgrade them more cheaply and we, um, this is better than spending a lot of money replacing lots and lots of tape machines. So I had the job of upgrading these machines and they never worked properly. The one thing that they'd forgotten was this tape path here which um, for the audio files amongst you will recognize as a very very long tape path. And what we were doing is we were modifying them to transistor but also to stereo. And the tape weave that you get on that tape path played havoc with the phase of the stereo signals. So um, it was uh, when they did stay stable, or when they were stable, they didn't stay that way for very long. So I'm afraid that was another very good intentioned approach, which I felt, quite frankly, didn't really work out. Uh, more lessons to be learned perhaps uh, I was in the operational group that I was working in a broadcasting house and uh, s someone came along with this kit a PCM system which was going to be used to distribute audio from broadcasting house actually right throughout the country but I think the first steps were Rutum and Holm Moss so there's a bit of a, a map here and um, it, 
it came into our in, into our laboratory and uh, lots of engineers taking valves out of valve amplifiers and um, in fact in the studios very often the valve amplifiers when they went what happened was they exploded the valves exploded so a typical engineer's job was to have a paintbrush and brush away the glass pull out the, the socket and plug a new tube in job done that didn't really excite me um, but it excited, it seems, everyone else in the laboratory because they said, we've been doing this for years, we don't want to get involved in this new digital uh, stuff. John, you do it. And actually, I was really pleased to get involved in installing, commissioning and getting this working. So it was 13-bit, oh, I feel awful saying this in Dolby, 13-bit, <laughs> 13, 13, cha 13 channels, six stereo channels, 32 kilohertz of PCM audio, um, not exactly Atmos. <laughs> Anyway, it, it worked, although it did have a Dolby type trick to get over the small sample, number of samples. Um, BBC colleagues didn't want to get involved. They were happy to keep repairing valves. Um, I, at that time, had a very much an open mind, um, although I, I'm told it does get harder to keep an open mind as you get older. And most importantly, Essex had used, told me that 5 volts and 24 volts weren't dangerous. Uh, valves at 100 volts and mains at 200 volts is dangerous. So that didn't seem like a very good idea. This, this was safe stuff. Um, and uh, so I, w I was re very, very lucky to have a chance to, to work on this. Um, I slightly put off as a disconnected statement, but it's an important one. Um, I really do value the time with the BBC and experience it in operational environments because although I spent a lot of my career in commercial organisation, I found over the years that having an appreciation of life in a professional, in, a, in an operational environment is very, very important. Uh, sadly, as a result of this, I was given offers to move elsewhere in the BBC designs department, I think it was then, and maybe even research. But my boss said, no, you're, whoops, you're an expert on this. You need to stay and work on it. And there's another um, uh, tip for those of you managers. You know this too well. If you tell someone who wants to move on that they've got to stay and continue doing the same job, the risk is that they will actually, instead of moving internally, they'll get a job somewhere completely different, which is what I did. I moved to the IBA, the Independent Broadcasting Authority, which was looking after ITV at that time. Getting into research and development and uh, working indirectly under Howard Steele, but through John Baldwin, Ken Barrett and many other very fascinating and great people. We did some great work on standards conversion, but the key was digital video recording. Quite frankly, those were magic days. Um, they, Engineers, we were experimenting with new technologies and we didn't have commercial pressures at that time. We really enjoyed it. And eventually that work led to the offer um, for me to follow actually Howard Steele into, into Sony. But what I, IBA taught me, lots of things, but I just picked out a couple of things. The most important being um, over the years I've realised that good leaders really are important and do inspire the team. Howard pictured here at the IEE, uh, giving an IEE lecture where he was demonstrating one of our early prototypes. Um, Howard was fantastic because he went out into the world. He went to all the various committees and he said, you know, the work that we're doing at the IBA is the most important work. He evangelised the work that we were doing. And he actually, um, whether it was the most important work or other, he put the IBA on the agenda, he put our work on the agenda and I have to say as a team, Clive who's in the audience, he was with me at the time, um, you know we were incredibly motivated I think to, to do better and work harder and the results improved I think in part because you had someone who was championing, championing our cause. They were 28 year, amazing years at Sony um, Sony Professional Europe. I joined as I think of one of 16 staff. It may have been fewer of than that, but I didn't want to exaggerate. Um, it went to a worldwide team of thousands. Uh, we were recruited to continue the work of the DVTR, bringing it closer to commercialization. And 
again, a very exciting time because it was all about creating a different broadcast world, um, which was very, very thrilling for me as a research engineer at that time. Very fortunate to get the opportunity to move up the ranks to become a director of the organization. Um, but Sony was playing the long game, which I think is very admirable in many ways. Um, it was, we were working eight years in the laboratory, even after the work at the IBA on the digital VTR before it was eventually going to see the light of the day as the DVR, the first one, the DVR 1000. And through that time, just as an anecdote, three times a year to Japan, uh, do the maths, it was getting uh, very close or exceeding 80 times. But I come back to the theme of good leaders. Mori Morizono was the big head of Sony at that time, Sony professional worldwide. And he joined in 1953 in Sony. Um, he'd pioneered developments in professional broadcast and manufacturing and many other uh, bits and pieces there. Um, and he gave us, our European team, our big break. Uh, as it happens, we were working on the digital VTR, but there was a parallel team in Japan working. And they were doing exactly the same thing. And when it came to commercialization, a decision had to be made which approach to the design of the machine was Sony going to take. So we had a big conference actually in, in the UK. Mori chaired it. And to my amazement, we all presented what we'd done and what we thought, we, what we thought needed to be do, done. But to my amazement, Mori actually said, I'm going with the European solution. Now, uh, I thought that was amazingly brave of him because it would have been very easy to have voted for the home team, as it were. But he took the chance and went with us. And the technology that existed in that VTR and the subsequent ones, because although they got smaller, they were all based upon the same designs. Um, the technology came out of the UK at that time. So um, these are some shots of some de demonstrations we gave of the VTRs, the original labs, and um, some downtime at Montreux there. Um, I'll go straight to the, um, the learning points. Clearly, with disruptive technology, a disruptive change, there are opportunities. We've got to recognize those. And those opportunities mean that whereas mature technology tends to stagnate and grow more slowly, clearly, um, once you get a, a new technology takes off, the potential for growth is, is much, much faster. But having said that, over the years, I've seen that timing is everything. It's the elephant in the room, if you like. Lots of great ideas have not taken off because they've been great ideas, but with the wrong timing. A few words about Sony, because I think there's some lessons here as well. Um, Sony uh, started up just after the Second World War. And it was really charged with a number of things. One, helping to, uh, from the areas that it was expert in, rebuild Japan, and certainly in terms of technology and electronics, but also to give people a place to work as well. And I've taken one extract from their sort of founding charter, but uh, one of them is just saying we need to create companies that can give people a chance to work, a chance to earn money, a chance to live, and as you see, some great words here about um, the spirit of freedom and open-mindedness and where engineers with their sincere motivation can exercise their technological skills at the highest level. That's back in the very early days of Sony, when it first started, their founding <laughs> charter. So the word of caution, 1999, I was sat at my desk and um, uh, Mr. Oger, I think, was president, Mr. Day, managing director or CEO of Sony at the time. Um, this announcement came onto my desk that the organization was going to be reorganized to maximize shareholder value. My heart sank when I saw that because that is a world apart from what you're seeing in that top line. And was this the right thing to do? Well, in preparation for this, I was just thinking about it because I knew what I felt about it, but um, were there any more sort of clever people that have thought about it? And I turned up this book 
um, from Lynn Stout, and you can read it for yourself. She says, um, it's a big mistake uh, for most firms, myopic short-term thinking, expense of long-term performance, threatens the welfare of consumers, employees and communities and investors. She's written a whole book around that. So I think, for me, there was a short but rather dark period in Sony where this was the mantra that we were all expected to live to. So I put that up as a word of caution. Um, it's uh, very tough to survive with only the short-term thinking that that represents. Something else in business terms, just a throwaway. Um, over the years that I've been working, I just sense, you may feel differently, that when I first started in my career, that the UK, for a lot of broadcasting stuff, was the centre of universe. When you had companies like Ampex and others, RCA, a little bit of that focus went to North America. Then, of course, it, it went to Japan. And we can, there's a big question mark as to whether or not that will move to China or somewhere similar. So I think there's a message here about how, as you get very successful, you start to struggle with the size, the legacy, and the momentum. And that does leave the door for open others without that legacy um, to seize the initiative. And I think in some ways I'm talking about countries and economies, but actually there are similar issues with companies. A total digression now. Um, I was within the Sony days. We were invited out to a place 200 kilometers outside Moscow called Ryazan. And um, the good and the great of the European broadcasting industry were asked to give a several day seminar to Russian regional broadcasters. And um, they were going to hear, and I, there's a bus here that took us, and some of you may remember, I've just realized I recognize Chris Daubney. A few of you may know Chris Daubney, he sat there, but there were other names and faces that some of you would recognize that were out there. We were asked to go out, give lectures and presentations to a bunch of Russian um, regional broadcasters. Well, first thing, I was working for Sony, and I said, regional broadcasters are not likely to speak English, are they? That's right, none of them will. OK, how are we going to cope with that? We'll have a translator. OK, how are we going to get from the translator to the individuals? Hmm. Um, well, uh, we could um, send signals out to headphones. Well, how are you going to do that? And so I came up with the idea that Sony had a very cheap FM radio at that time. Um, but I had been previously shocked by the fact that they said they were going to set up an FM transmitter on the stage. I said, you can't do that. You can't just put up an FM transmitter in the, the most used radio waves. They said, this is Ryazan. We're 200 kilometers out of Moscow. We can do what we like. So sure enough, they set up a radio transmitter. I went out with um, these little FM radios and headphones, uh, a few hundred of them. They sort of disappeared the moment we went into the room, and that's what everybody is wearing there, these Sony headphones, FM receivers. So, job done? Well, not quite. As I walked down the aisle here, the first speaker was speaking, and I was thinking, wow, Sony, great, we're doing a good job. The show's on the road, but I'm not going to be able to do this very well. But as I walked down, I heard a... What was that? Are they really tuning into the translator or are they tuning into the local music station? And some of them were doing that, I have to say. It gets worse. So lunchtime comes and they all disappear, these Russian regional broadcasters. And so I'm thinking, where have they all gone? So I go outside and I hear a lot of shouting, a lot of laughter and a lot of fun going on. And I end up here on the banks of the river Oka, which was just 100 metres or so from the conference center, they're all skinny dipping. <laughs> they're skinny dipping in the river with bottles of vodka all laid out over the, <laughs> the, the banks here, and they're off their heads. And I thought, this is not the way it's supposed to work. This is all falling apart. And so anyway, I think, OK, I'm going back to a safe haven, going back to the conference. The afternoon starts, of course, half of them don't turn up. I say, well, what's happening? Oh, well, John, they've realised they can still receive the signal down at the, <laughs> the riverside. <laughs> it gets worse. Um, and so anyway, that went on. That night, we had some really lavish dinners. And I have to say, there was more... I'm, I'm not exact. You, you will believe I'm exaggerating, but I'm not exaggerating. There was more vodka on the table than anything else. 
And um, I left in the early hours of the morning, probably one or two, and they were still going at it. And the next morning I came down, and this is the moment for a bit of sombre tone here. I came down the next morning, I said, it's very quiet this morning. Uh, is it just because they were all drinking so late? It's partly that. It was, we were around till about four o'clock last night. Uh, yeah, it was partly that. But he said, uh, my Sony colleague said, John, um, they found someone dead this morning. It's alcohol poisoning. <laughs> oh, my God. So this, and then when we went back, the brake fluid went out of the bus. <laughs> Can anything else go wrong? You've got to believe that was an experience and probably the one standout experience of a certain kind in my life. So I'm <coughs> pleased I've shared it with you. It's like it, getting it off your chest. <laughs> um, <coughs> pro pair collaboration, another major milestone, uh, one which I and I hope a few people in this room are very proud of. Um, I was fortunate to be one of the instigators of the Pro MPEG forum and, and, a, and a director. And it was, quite frankly, an excellent example of companies and end users getting together to collaborate towards a common cause. Um, lots of working meetings around the world, um, technical sessions, demonstrations at trade shows. We worked on things like the application of MPEG because compression was becoming important in broadcast environments connectivity of MPEG-based systems, codes of practice, and the three-letter word MXF, which uh, 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 has become, I think, the if, uh, the, if not one of the industry standards. It was a success, but we all know uh, the rather checkered history of it. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I learned was it didn't matter if the group's motives were the same, as long as the outcome matched the requirements of each of those members. And another thing I learned is that you really do, amongst a, a bunch of thieves like technology suppliers, you need a trusted and independent leader and someone who can chair and keep you honest is vital. And that was <laughs> Nick Wells who sat in the audience and is here if you can't see him. He did a fantastic job of keeping us all honest. Um, but quite frankly, even Tried and tr trusted broadcasters sometimes didn't know what they wanted until they actually saw it working. And we didn't have anything necessarily working at that time. So the one regret in, us, in a way is that we, we ended up designing MXF to be all things to all men um, because we didn't know quite how it was going to be used. Um, we, we actually made it much more complex than it needed to be. And so a lot of the, the effort going into MXF in more recent days has been limiting the scope to specific applications. The other thing is, um, we did this. It was funded by the companies who were participating. And I, I know in many organizations, the tradition of getting government funding for development. I'm a little bit cynical about that because someone said to me once, which I tend to agree with, if it's worth doing, it's worth paying for. I think. Some countries, uh, companies get a little bit too comfortable on handouts from governments and lose focus of the commercial and the real requirements. Just a sort of throwaway then there. But these years were the best years for standards. Um, technology was moving somewhat slower at that time. Uh, and um, these standards, like always, were a co combination of the best solution and a little bit of political compromise. But we were, in those days, still looking for a single standard, a single standard uh, each time. Meetings held worldwide, technical demonstrations, fantastic friendships, and these were really good years for the EBU and SMPTE. Fast forward, um, life is much more difficult. SMPTE is still doing a fantastic job, but it, it's a struggle. Um, standards, one could argue, take too long to achieve. They're very complex, it's natural. Um, we've lost the concept of a single standard in many respects. I'm not saying a single standard is good, but the reality is the environment has changed. We have to deal with fragmentation. And um, many standards are, are now increasingly outside our control as we move more and more towards the IT industry. So actually a piece of work I'm doing within the IABM 
uh, and I'm particularly interested in is trying to get my head around what form will collaboration and interoperability take going forward? Um, do we just accept multiple options and the fragmentation that I referen reference there? So next step, IABM. Uh, which I still do work for part-time. Great experience. Um, I was ready to go into a smaller organization. It's a, a relatively small team. Um, much wider view of the industry. Obviously, working with Sony, I saw a Sony perspective th um, for those many years, but it's been a great now to be working with the 350 or so members of the IABM, uh, giving me a much broader perspective on things. And it's been clearly an opportunity to pay back some of my uh, experience and share some of the, uh, my experience. And also, the IABM is a non-profit organization doesn't have quite the commercial imperative of a for-profit organization. So uh, Andy said I was going to look backwards, but I, I really do need to look forward so you don't just want to hear about history. So um, the broadcast and in the media industry, from my perspective, is going through one of the changes that it's not for a long time experienced, so radical. Absolutely everything is changing. How programs are produced, both technical and operational, the programs that are produced, what they are, financing, how content's distributed, all these things, um, where and how people are watching the programs. Absolutely every aspect of our industry is changing right now. One of the headline topics is UHD. And uh, I'd just like to say I think UHD is very different to HD. We said that HD was the new SD. That was the kind of terminology that was often being spoken of. But UHD is not the replacement for HD, at least for many years in, in my view. But UHD is important, it's going to be successful, but it's also going to be something that consolidates the fact we live in a multi-format world. And those f formats, the number of them, will grow. Um, lots of TVs in the shops, lots of, because it's easy to increase the number of pixels in a TV set. Better pixels um, is what everyone's talking about. How can we in, go further in, and enhance the picture to add value? I feel strange saying that in the home of Dolby, but um, this is where a lot of that work is being done. You have to remember that HD success was based on of course, the improved picture, but also the fact it came at the time of flat panel displays. So there you had a new exciting display that could exploit the, the new picture quality as well. With UHD, we're still talking flat panel displays, so we don't have that added advantage. So some of these additional things are, of course, important. Um, so UHD is a game changer. It's consolidating what I would say is the multi-format world, and it's increasing the urgency for a format independent infrastructure. Um, and also, I would say that the quality change is less than the change, the step function that we got with standard to high definition. So I believe UHD will be successful initially for specialized services and programs, obviously for movies as well, but not as HD was once claimed to be a replacement for HD. It has, though, driven and accelerated the need for all these things on the left-hand side. A pretty obvious, sorry, a pretty obvious list of things um, that um, are all facing our industry. But the bottom line is they're pushing us faster and faster towards uh, IT-based hardware and software solutions. Format independent is the key, if you like, unique selling point there. Um, but also with my work within the IABM, it's becoming clear that we're moving more towards a revenue rather than a capital-based industry, and we're moving much more towards a service-based industry. The cloud has got something to do with that. I like some of these quotes that I've taken from Netflix and HBO. In particular, Reed Hastings controversially suggests that traditional TV has got about two decades left to live as internet TV growth continues. Um, he reckons that TV is going to be a bit like a large iPad. Well, actually, I agree with him on the first. I don't necessarily agree with him on the second. Um, I do like this unconventional episode length, though. Uh, we have been living in an environment where we run by 30-minute segments. 
even in the commercial TV world, that the design of a program, the concept of a program, is designed to ramp up as the commercials come and pick up where the commercials lift off. Those are very artificial factors in the creative side of making programs. So I'm taking his words as meaning that we don't have the constraints of a schedule of 30 minutes, one hour, and we don't have the constraints of um, uh, advertising in the same way. HBO have upset the industry uh, fairly recently by saying they're going to start some over-the-top services, giving people um, access to content which they can't get through regular broadcasting. And they're saying that with 10 million households in the US with only broadband, clearly they see there is a business model to be had there when those people don't have a satellite dish, cable or an aerial. And of course, um, the international aspects are fascinating. So I really do believe that the internet is a game changer. Um, it's almost a truism to say that now. Um, a lot of people, some users do receive high enough speed internet to make it all a viable business model for program delivery. Clearly, you've got some unique selling points here which, um, uh, which can't be challenged by conventional broadcast and clearly capacity will increase uh, um, across the world potentially at different rates. And also the new generation do understand the internet better than satellite, terrestrial uh, and, um, and cable indeed. They don't understand the need for aerials. National boundaries are challenged. And interesting statistic from Google saying that already 750 million TV uh, dis uh, displays are internet connected with 1 billion by 2020. Legacy is one of the big challenges we all face, um, especially uh, with technology change. Larger companies, I've seen this myself, you've seen it, carry mo a lot of momentum. New entrants don't have that problem. And actually, I'm not a Microsoft lover, but I'm actually impressed uh, with what Microsoft are doing under new management now. They're being much more aggressive about switching off some of their legacy support. And they're coming up with some quite creative ideas, some of which I will touch upon in a few moments. Something else that I, I pondered over is how, as life's getting so complex, how are we dealing with this in a technological sense? And when I started at university, I was playing around with single transistors just getting into ICs. And now we've got five to seven billion transistors on the latest Intel Haswell uh, chip. And indeed, IBM have got something similar. But I guess the way we're managing these complex systems is that actually um, what were um, systems are becoming components. So this component is now a collection of those and this component is now a collection of those and to my mind and this applies in the software software world with dlls as well that we are actually trying to manage the complexity by turning um, what were once systems into components another key message is the industry is no longer uh, purely about technology when I started, I would say it was technology driven. It, it created the rules. It told program people what they could make uh, and how they were going to make it. Uh, it's now technology enabled. It enables the technology, but it gives people much more choice. Image quality is important, of course, but there's a lot more that comes into the mix these days, whether it's business, um, operations and consumer facing activities is all grown in importance and the decisions are much less about the technology so um, when we when I joined the technologist was absolute king we've got to share that um, now with a lot of different people talked a little bit about small and large organizations small organizations <laughs> common purpose um, very efficient Perhaps uh, one of the things I hear most is that they tend to be somewhat resource constrained. Medium sized companies, some divergence, tough decisions as to whether or not they can stay small. A lot of people say it's very difficult to stay small and stay successful or whether or not they try and push themselves into the big lead, a league, a little less efficiency there. But when you get into large organizations, personally experience this, the vectors are out of control. Some people are actually working against you in your company. You don't know it. They may not be doing it consciously, but you really do have a loss of efficiency or productivity as you go up. It's still huge. 
it's still very effective, but it doesn't scale up linearly. And, and this is the kind of thing you have to contend with. I remember talking to one large corporation, huge corporation, who claimed they got two engineers who were keeping it alive. They were producing the jewel in the crown that was keeping that huge corporation alive. So that, I think, is a very extreme <coughs> example of this. Don't hang on to legacy, embrace change. PAL Plus, high definition. Um, PAL Plus, fantastic solution, keeping PAL, our previous analog television system alive, producing improvements, couldn't, couldn't fault the cleverness of it and the ability, but actually what we really needed was digital. We needed a clean sweep. So PAL, was, PAL Plus was introduced um, a, a few, into a few countries in a small way, but it, it really didn't take off and it died. And I think there's a message there, just giving the uh, sort of resuscitation to some of these older formats is not the right way to go. There were a lot of great arguments to say that high definition should be 1280 by 720. And a lot of able, people were able to prove at that time that there was almost indiscernible quality difference between the two based upon the technology that was available at that time. Um, I was always, uh, and it was well reported, supporting 1920 by 1080. And I'm pleased to say, I'm not claiming um, being particularly clever here, but I'm pleased to say uh, it did turn out that way. There is still some 1280 by 70 in the world, but um, this is still the high definition format of choice at the moment. And the reality is radical new solutions often initially underperform the established solution. So it's very easy to trash a, um, a new solution because if you just adjust the, the current solution, sometimes you can make it outperform this new one. But eventually, they can come from behind and eventually perform better. Another area I'd say watch out for is the second tier. Um, I'm particularly fascinated by this. Um, with the introduction of commodity acquisition products, uh, commodity and low-cost content distribution, it's opened up the opportunity for more people to become broadcasters. I've just taken two examples here. The cycling one has 90,000, the statistics are there, you probably can't read it, 90,000 live viewers at the moment this was taken. The bottom one's got 896 live viewers of these two events. Um, and the interesting thing is, I can tell you that because the analytics were there live and real time, something that's very, very hard to do with conventional television. So there's one USP. But um, these are people who are creating valid business models, broadcasting models based upon so-called second tier sports. And sometimes you can liken this to what's sometimes called the, the, the long tail. And actually that long tail could be a very serious business proposition. One example, PlayStation View, all these channels available on PlayStation View, some of them conventional, some of them those second tier broadcasters, available live or um, over the top via, in this case, I just chose truly at random, one example. Standing up here at my age, I can't stand here without talking about age. Um, research by Deloitte showed that um, for TV, not surprisingly, it's the 68-year-old. Um, I'm not in this band, by the way. I just want to say very quickly, I'm not in that band. I won't tell you which one I'm in. You can probably work it out. But um, this band is, are most popular for pay TV. It's completely the reverse for video streaming and music streaming, where you've got the 14 to 25-year-olds. The only thing I want to say to you is I don't believe that they are going to adopt the attitudes of their parents as they grow older. Some a little bit maybe, but I think these habits are going to live with them and it's going to be serving the older generation with conventional technology as we go forward. Um, consumers, much more diverse group these days. You all know this, telephones, mobile phones and so on. We haven't got to where we need to be. Consumers expect much, a much more integrated experience, more interactivity uh, and social media. There's no going back, though. We'll get there. I quite like this slide from IBC. Uh, it said that it, what um, is IBM have produced it. Three imperatives for success. Address the growing demand for nonlinear reinvent the customer experience, and transform the broadcast business. 
multiple data channels, not a surprise, re-engineer the digital workflow, and again, this is one I'm interested in, partner for success. I think that is really important going forward, and we've got to figure out how we're going to partner for success. I think the consumer is more in control now. Um, the times when they were told what they couldn't have, what they couldn't have because they didn't have any other choice has gone. They, consumers now can make and break large corporations because um, they can decide whether or not to buy those products because there are always alternatives, there are always choices. And that is relevant to us because consumer trends at the end of the day affect us in professional developments. We can't predict the future, so um, the reality is experimental, experimentation is the key. It's almost trial and error. Um, obsolescence, new trends are often not predicted. You could give your own examples. Op optical disc matured and is in decline. How many heard, of you heard this? Everyone loves and to hold and touch the actual media. I've said that in the past. I don't believe it. I've got rid of all my CDs, gave them to charity. Don't need them anymore. Um, traditional TV screens in Sony, believe it or not, well after the introduction of the flat screen, we believed Trinitron forever. I'm ashamed to admit it, but we believed it. Trinitron forever was a mantra that went on far too long in Sony before we woke up to the fact that um, the flat screen display was here to stay. And we obviously underestimated the mobile phone. I said, I'm not a Microsoft lover, but I, there's a video which you can all hunt out. Maybe some of you have seen it. But Microsoft are showing some visions of the future, which I find pretty interesting. Because I don't think the future of TV is just about us buying bigger and bigger screens. We need something more innovative than that. And I'm not saying Microsoft has got the answer, but at least they're showing some uh, sort of blue, uh, blue sky ideas uh, that what it might be. We've seen a lot about virtual reality. Um, Microsoft are talking about virtual reality, but also more in terms of holograms. The ability to transform and create a virtual screen on your wall. All these devices in your kitchen will need some kind of electronic control. Instead of making them um, real, could they be virtual? If you're in the design environment, can you create a 3D um, environment or 3D model um, that you can adjust? And of course, at the end of the day, bringing it down to the lowest common denominator, it'll probably be games where the virtual environment really takes off and some of the big money is spent. Timing is everything. It's the elephant in the room. A lot of good ideas have failed because the timing wasn't right. Um, but speed of change is often overestimated and the scale and impact underestimated. That's what I've seen from experience. Just to remind you, NHK first started work on HD in 1969-70. Long introduction, a huge impact. Mobile phones, mobile devices, many predicted they'd be a novelty or just for corporate use, um, huge impact. Standards and ideas are frequently too early or too late. A BBC research quote that I've taken there, that's not one of mine. What would I do differently? Um, well. Getting a bit personal now, I guess, but um, I'm not as confident as it might seem. Um, outward confidence of, often hides insecurity. Um, not sure how much we can control that. Um, I've been a very competitive person. I love sports. Uh, in fact, uh, Andy or Chris or someone said, walking up the, the steps. I, I like keeping fit. Um, that's made me quite competitive. That's not always a good thing. Um, perhaps more seriously, we are in a world of experimentation, so we've got to be prepared to fail, and we've got to be prepared to learn from that. And Jane will tell you the most important thing is time management, which is not my strength. Um, my personal passion, video and audio, getting back to my roots. Um, I've built myself a video studio, an audio studio. Um, Jane's been very kind. We've turned the dining room into a media room. I did have to build another dining room to get that to happen. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, we've turned the dining room into a media room, which can be the control room for the studio as well. So uh, I'm getting back to my operational roots, which I think has been so important in my commercial career, understanding the reality of um, uh, how the creative processes work and how people actually work. Few conclusions, 
And this is back to more business. This is a new era like no other. It's a fascinating era. Everything's changing, as I said at the beginning. Technology, production and consumption. Um, those that rely on traditional business models are facing a slow decline. Some of us might say that doesn't matter because we'll have retired, um, but that's not the right way to think about it. Um, you need to get involved now. Um, in experimentation is important because actually learning from experimentation is something that you can't catch up with quickly, so you need to get involved. It is a, it's an exciting period of opportunity, uh, especially for those who embrace it. We've... Um, I would love to give you, and I'm not going to say anything more than this, uh, more talk about sustainability in the environment. That's an area we're having great difficulty in getting traction on in our industry. The fact that everything is changing is a great opportunity to integrate more thinking about the environment and sustainability. Uh, and of course, every country has a different experience. So. Um, you've been very patient, and I hope there's been something of interest for everyone. I'll just leave you with this thought. Uh, the three eyes which are changing broadcast, the broadcast and media world. IT, IP, and the internet. Thank you very much.